All right, the kids are released. That's the rest of us open our Bibles, please, this morning to Ephesians chapter 4. We always like to let visitors know we go verse by verse through the Bible on Sunday mornings, chapter by chapter on Wednesday nights. And we're currently in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And let's go ahead. We're going to read once again 11 uh, through 16. And then we're going to come back to our text this morning, which will be verses 14 and 15. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Father, once again, we come and we ask that you would anoint us afresh, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, Lord. That as we hear your word, Lord, we know it is alive. May our hearts be made alive to you. May you fill me afresh, Father, as I preach and teach this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now last week we studied about how as we sit under the teachings, uh, as we read here in our text of the apostles and the prophets, that as our pastor teachers are doing this faithfully, and as we ourselves are studying and obeying the word of God every day, and, and, and as we will then be equipped for the work of the ministry, we will be built up as the body of Christ. And that this will lead us then, as again we see in the text before ours this morning, to a unity of the faith under their teaching the scriptures to the exact and precise knowledge of Jesus Christ as we studied last week and who he is. And that brings us into a mature manhood, a mature womanhood, to the measure of the stature we read here in the fullness of Christ. To put it simply, we will be changing more and more into the image of Jesus Christ our Lord as we mature in our faith. And you see, that's kind of the key as we come into verse 14, as we, we read everything to get it in text. Paul is talking about us maturing in our faith. And I think, again, as we said last week, it's an easy deception that we believe, oh, I've been a Christian for so many years, thus I am, you know, this a strong Christian, I'm a, this Christian. It doesn't matter how many years we've been a Christian. It matters if we've been maturing spiritually or not. And obviously, as the Holy Spirit is breathing this through Paul, this was a problem within the church of Ephesus, and I believe it's a huge problem, huge problem, within the church today. Some of you might get that, some of you might not. Huge. Verses 14 and 15 is what we're going to hone in on this morning. Look at verse 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So as we mature in our faith in accordance to God's word, we see this morning we're going to be looking at two main things that we see in verses 14 and 15. Two main things. Number one, that we may no longer be children. No longer be children. And number two, we are to grow up in Christ. 
So look here with me at verse 14. So that we may no longer be children. Now last week we were really looking at at, at, at maturity, be maturing, growing as a Christian and what that means. And if you notice, as we're looking at these two things this morning, this first one here is in the negative, so that you may no longer be children. This is what we're no longer to be as Christians, children in our faith. We're to be growing up. And again, this is a command here. This isn't a choice. Well, I kind of like being a child. Amen? You know, what, there's a thing going around out there that said, you know, don't grow up, it's a trap. <laughs> you think it's so wonderful as you look around, oh, I can't wait to have my own this and my own that, and then you're like, when you're growing up, I want you to go back home. <laughs> but you know what? As we're told in the Bible, we're to have childlike faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his word, what he's told us. But we, you know, completely trusting that it is true, completely trusting with childlike faith and obedience to God's word. But we're to be growing, maturing in our faith. Growing up as men and women, Christians unto the faith. You know, here in our text, the word children, it's actually, it's not even children, it's immature infants. Immature infant. So being a child in our faith is not a good thing. Especially if you've been a Christian for more than a year or two. We should be growing in our faith continually. And by the way, there, there's not a place that we ever come to where we stop and say, I've reached full maturity. Not this side of heaven at least. Can I have an amen? Amen. So, and as we looked at this last week, you don't have to turn there because we turned there last week, but I'm going to read it again because we, we have a perfect picture of what, child, what a children is to the Lord through his word. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, it says this, There is much more I would like to say to you about this, but it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. By the way, are there any here tonight or this morning? You've been a Christian so long now you should be teaching others. Instead, it says, you need someone to teach you. Again, the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant. Same Greek word there. Doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, those, you know, who through training have the skill to recognize the between right and wrong. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again, and let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. That's the same word we studied last week in the previous verse. You see, within the church, a lot of us I know that I grew up in a church that basically taught you that, that your pastor, that the one above you, they had their relationship with God for you. So you would come to church, they would do all the praying, they would do all the fasting, they would do all the spiritual things, and, and basically in turn you would give them your devotion. You would, you know, give them your trust, you would do what they told you to do, and well, you go talk to the big man upstairs for me, Father, I'm going to go off and do, continue in my sin. And there wasn't an encouragement to grow spiritually. And even within the church today, there is a movement against and away from God's word. There was a pastor that just last week that declared we should be moving away from the moors of the Old Testament, he said. Leave them behind. His, his father, everyone here would know, his son is a very famous uh, preacher now, and, and he's going off into uh, bad areas. His name's Andy Stanley. Putting down the Old Testament. I, I say that in warning to us, to know who to listen to, who not. And the reason I bring that up is because they encourage you to be a child in your faith and not to read the scriptures and grow up. We're to trust them and not God through his word. You see, I'm not here to have your relationship with Jesus for you. Sorry to bum some of you out. And seriously, some of you are bummed because you think you can come Sunday morning or maybe Wednesday night, two hours a week, 
and then spend the rest of your week how you want to without investing spiritually in your life and you think it's all good. It's not all good. We need to be taking responsibility for our own walks in Jesus Christ, our own maturity in Jesus Christ. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, we studied this last week, so again, I'm just going to read it. It says this, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would spiritual people. I had to talk to you, though, as though I belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid foods, because you weren't ready for anything stronger, and you still aren't ready, for you are still being controlled by your sinful nature. Have you ever gotten together with someone like that? Someone who professes Christ and you sit down to have a meal with them and you're so excited to hear about their walk with the Lord. What are they reading? What are they doing? What's the Lord doing in their life? And you try to go there and they, they're resistant. They, they don't go there because they're kind of like almost like a deer in the headlights. What do I do? What do I say when well, my pastor's asking me what I'm reading or my friend's asking me what have I been praying about lately because I haven't been reading or I haven't been praying. And it's hard because you soon realize, hey, that this person, you know, they might be a Christian, but they're just a babe in the faith. But here's the dangerous part, by the way, about being a babe in the faith. When you read about what they are, we, today there's a lot of people who call people carnal Christians. Or they'll say they're backslidden. Or other such things. You know the sad part is, we can't tell the difference between a carnal Christian and somebody who is not saved. And that's a dangerous place to be. Dangerous fence to try to sit upon. You see, beloved, here in our text this morning, we see that we are no longer, notice again, it's in the negative, no longer to be children in our faith. Again, we're not, no longer to be an infant. We're no longer to be, in the Greek there, a simple-minded person, it says. We're to be growing in the things of the Word. Man, what a glorious thing it is, by the way, as you're reading through your Bible day by day. And, and I always encourage people to read, you know, if you haven't done it, then start, you know, read one chapter in Genesis, one chapter in the Psalms, and one chapter in, in starting in the book of John. And then do that every day. Keep reading at least those three chapters. Read more if you like. If there's a huge chapter, then read half, half it. But you're going to see things that start coming together. You're going to see things as you grow deeper in the things of the Lord, as the, as the Holy Spirit starts to speak to you through his word like you've never had before. And he changes you and he washes you. He matures you. He grows you and, and, and we grow in our faith. So to be an immature infant is something that we are not to be. And again, it's further described here. Look at verse 14. So you may no longer be children. Notice that the children are the ones who are tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind. These are those who in their faith are just being tossed to and fro by the waves. They're carried about by the winds. You know, when I was a little kid, me and my brother, you know, we, see, we had seen some old movies where these kids would make these little sailboats and put them in the water. And, and it was so cool. We made a cool little sailboat with wood and, you know, a stick and a sail. And it was so awesome. We put it in this, you know, little kind of um, river kind of thing. And we put it in there and it sails out. The wind catches it. We're like, ooh, this is awesome. It just sails out. And it's like, it's working, it's working. And then all of a sudden we're like, how are we going to get it? It just, it go, it just f f blew away. And we're, we're devastated. We never built any more sailboats. We're like, yeah, forget that, man. But you see, that's what being a child spiritually is. It's described, you're, you're being tossed to and fro by the waves, being carried about by every wind. The word picture here is one of, be, of a boat. That when we get saved, basically... We're either, you know, going somewhere specific on a set course or we're just allowing the circumstances of life, how I feel one day, how I feel the next. We're being tossed and to and fro by the waves, carried about by the wind. That's a babe in faith. That's a babe in faith. Tossed to and fro, carried about 
by the wind. This is one who is immature. There's no real direction in their course as a Christian. There's no real aim in their life. You see, they become a Christian, they get into a boat, yet they're not following the map that they've been given. The course that we all have right in our hands, even right now. This is our course for life. This is, this is our, to help us to get to that ultimate destination as we are headed to heaven. You see, these are those, though, those that are immature, those that are babies, that, that, that they believe that just climbing into the boat is good. I got saved. I'm climbing into the boat. It doesn't matter what I do with the rest of my life. Woohoo! I'm going to go live life, you know, party on, dude, and, and just, I'll see you at the end of the trail, Lord. And even some who will come on Sundays. It, again, it doesn't matter if I read my Bible every week. I, I got the Christian thing down. It doesn't matter if I hear from the Lord or walk in the Spirit of God. I got, I get, I got it all down. And yet they're being tossed to and fro. Just whatever, whatever happens, they just go away. They're sailing away. But notice what happens as they're tossed to and fro, what they're carried, tossed to and fro by, what they're carried about by. Notice it says here, it gives us three things. Of doctrine, every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So we, we see that as they're being tossed to and fro, they're ca being carried about by every wind, every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Those three things. The first one here is every wind of doctrine. Doctrine here in the Greek is basically what it says in the English. It's doctrine, it's teaching, it's instruction. And the thought here is though that every new wind of doctrine that blows through the church, these are those that, man, they just, let, let's go, let's get caught up in that wind of doctrine. You know, in my time, it's been everything since the vineyard movement to hearing angels sing during the worship service. Oh, did you hear the angels singing with us during worship? I did. They were beautiful. To gold dust falling down from the rafters and feathers supposedly from angels. And this was back in the 80s, by the way. It's come around again in some of the heretical churches again today. So from that stuff to the Reformation movement or the New Reformation movement to Reformed theology to seeker-friendly movement to the emergent church movement to the relevant church movement to the emergent relevant church movement. And on they go. And they're just being tossed to and fro because they're not mature in their faith. They are not men and women of the Word of God grounded on the Word of God. So they're just tossed to and fro by every bozo that comes through preaching a new thing that sounds kind of cool or a new band that sounds really great. Well, they, have, they play good music, so they've got to be godly, bro. No. You see, it's usually stuff that's fun, new, exciting, not old, not the old paths. It's the new stuff, man. That's where it's all about. Be careful, beloved in Christ. Be careful where you receive your doctrines from. Be careful what you read. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you watch. Take everything as the Bereans did in the book of Acts and test it to the word of God. Test it to God. Even to when I'm teaching this morning, whenever I teach, I always encourage, do test what I say. Don't just take, well, well Pastor, Bill, Pastor Bill said it, man. He's a great guy. He's a godly man. He's the most intelligent man I've ever heard. He's the most good-looking guy I've ever seen. No, sorry. <laughs> said nobody ever. No, <laughs> but here's the point. We test what we hear to the word of God, not to our own, you know, theology, not to our own minds, not to my church. What does God's word say about it? Remember what we studied before, the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. This is what Paul warned about what happened, by the way, that his people were kind of babes in the faith in a large scale. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, please. In the last days, it talks about this happening on steroids. 
2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 3. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. See, these are those who are babies in their faith. These are those who were not mature in their faith. They just want to hear the good stuff. They want to hear the stuff that makes them, that tickles their ears, that feels good. You know, if you ever get a newborn baby, you know, even with, with Samantha, if you take her and you just rub her earlobes. Babies usually love that. One of the, you know, sometimes you rub their head. They, and, and that's how a lot of babies as Christians are. Hey, just tickle my ears, rub my head, make me feel good. And I'll come to your church, I'll, I'll, t- I'll, I'll give you every man, just make me feel. That's not what a true Christian does. It's not what a mature Christian does. So first of all, they're carried about by every wind of doctrine. Secondly, we're told here, by human cunning. Notice, human cunning. This, this goes a little deeper now. Literally, this is an interesting words here in the Greek. It literally means sleight of hand. Sleight of hand. Human cunning is a sleight of hand. It references someone who might be doing a magic trick or someone who is cheating while playing cards or dice. You know, I remember when I was a young kid, I used to love magic tricks, and you could buy some what were called loaded dice. They were weighed down. And what would you do is you'd have two pair of dice. You'd have one pair that was regular, and then you had another pair that was weighted down, and every time you rolled them, the same number would come up. And that's what this is referencing. And sleight of hand would be, you know, when they're not looking, you get, hey, look at that guy over there, and you, you, you switch the dice out, and you go. It's the same thing with magicians today. Whenever they tell you to look over here, look at them. Whenever they go, oh, boom, then there's a fire going off there, what are they doing back over here? It's all sleight of hand. It's all trickery. And that's what this is talking about here in the Greek. It literally means fraud, trickery. Um, because dice players sometimes cheated and defrauded their fellow players, said one Greek scholar. In the Amplified Bible, it translates this part of the verse this way, here in Ephesians 4.14. The prey of the cunning and the cleverness of unscrupulous men. So it is the babies in their faith who are those that are tossed to and fro, secondly here, by human cunning, cunning, purposeful cheating. You know, I remember years ago when I was a young Christian and I'd come across, I was just flipping through the channels. This was back in the 80s. And so I was flipping through the channels at a friend's house and I came across a a Christian channel, Christian channel. And they were having one of their fun drives. And, and the lady or guy on there, I forget which it was now, but they basically said something to the fact of have faith, give $1,000, $3,000, or even $5,000. And if you don't have the money, just put it on your credit card. Have faith that God will return 10, 20, or even 100 times over your act of faith. I called them up. And they're like, hey, do you want to give? I'm like, no, it's like, why don't you give to me? If you have so much faith, just give me all your money, then you guys don't have to ask for money anymore. See, what they were doing was preying on people's ignorance, taking scripture out of context. Oh, if you give to the Lord, you're guaranteed 10, 20, 30, 100 times over. I remember for years, it's kind of died off in the last five or ten years, but for years I would get stuff from all different ministers. When you're pastoring churches or in the ministry, you get all this weird stuff. I remember one time, you know, somebody sent me, it was this little piece of cloth, and it was from Brother So-and-so, and he's a world-famous preacher, teacher, evangelist, saint of God, and, it, and he sweat on this thing that we've given to you. Now, before you can activate it by faith, you need to send us a gift of $100 or whatever it was. I'm not kidding. Crazy, crazy stuff. Or else we'll have others that will knock on our door. Hey, want to become part of the kingdom hall or other things. 
and they're peddling a false gospel. You see, these are those who are seeking to take advantage of those who may love the Lord, but are very immature in their faith, and they don't know the word. Oh, this sounds really good. I'm going to go check out this place. You know, I'm going to go see what's going on. And, and since they have not matured in the word and biblical doctrine, so they are so easily just fall into these cunning schemes of men and women, and they just get taken advantage of. So we see first here that they're, you know, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Secondly, by human nature. And third here, we're told, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Do you notice how it's getting kind of worse? You know, it's almost like, you know, kind of some, well, just kind of, well, whatever happens, wind and doctrine, then human cunning. But now it's by purposeful craftiness and deceitful schemes. Literally here in the Greek it reads this. It's very interesting. Cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And if you don't believe there are those within the church today lying in wait to deceive you, you're deceived. We need to remember this, to be careful. You know, Jesus, Peter, Paul, John, Jude, and many other teachers and, you know, throughout the New Testament all warned of false teachers that would come, that would be from in the church, although some of them went out of the church and, and so proving we're told in the scripture that they were never really of us. Jesus described them as wolves in sheep's clothing. There might even be some here this morning. Be careful, beloved, in Christ, because there are so many out there that are purposely seeking to deceive us with cunning craftiness, and they lie in wait to deceive you. I can't tell you how many calls we get even still. Hey, we're we're out of gas. We're at a gas station right now, and me and my wife and 15 kids, we just were happy. I got a new job in Tacoma. We're on our way. And we're church-going people, by the way. They always throw that in. We're church-going people. And sometimes, to be honest, a lot of those I pass off to Pastor Jay, and you can imagine how he deals with them. But I used to like to, you know, because I always, it's like, Lord, there might be that one that really does need some help. Help us to discern. But I'll be real honest, it's, it's hard to find those people in, in, in that circumstance anymore. Because you start asking them, oh, you go to church? Oh, I go to church all the time, every Sunday. What did your preacher teach on this last Sunday? Oh, I don't remember. What's your pastor's name? Oh, uh, uh, Joe. Joe what? Joe Mama. No, it's, it's like, <laughs> well, let's call your pastor right now and see what's going on. He would know you, right? Oh, well, no, I don't think so. You know, we haven't really been going there that and again, it all just starts to fall apart. There was a news story just a couple years ago where there was a couple ladies going down around the Portland, Vancouver area purposely doing that same kind of thing, and they got caught, and they'd done this to like 20 or 30 churches and got thousands of dollars. We need to be mature in our faith. Jesus described it as being wise as serpents and innocents in, um, as doves. We need to grow up. We need to grow up. We talked about this last week. People don't like to grow up anymore. We get to a place where we feel comfortable. I don't want to keep growing. I want to just relax now. Hey, you know what, beloved in Christ? That is never our place as Christians. Never our place as Christians. We are to continue to grow in our knowledge of God's word and in our obedience to the Lord through his word because we love him with that childlike faith. Notice here, again, that we're to may no longer be tossed to and fro by the, the waves and carried about by the wind of doctrine, by human counting, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So first, we need to stop being immature infants in our faith. Okay, now secondly, here, as we continue on to verse 15, we, we read this. Notice in verse 15. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way. You see, beloved in Christ, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I need to be told, hey, Bill, grow up. Can I have an amen? Hey, sometimes we need to to be reminded, grow up. And I don't care if you're 70, 80, 50, 40, 30, 20, 15, grow up in your faith. May we grow up. Notice, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into 
Christ. So remember, in the last verse, we had the negative, no longer be children, and now we have the positive, that we are to grow up in every way. Now, we note again that the first way was basically aimless, it was lazy, it's reckless, it's childlike, it's, no, I don't want to do that. But now we know it's the second way this, to be growing up. It is pers pers purposeful, it is direct, it is loving. Notice, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is head into Christ. Now notice here. Instead of wandering aimlessly in our faith, we're to do two things. Number one, we're to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Number two, we are to grow up in every way. You know, last week I gave a plea to the men within our fellowship to mature because we need godly men within the church. And it's a sad thing within the church today, not just here, but, but here also, in, but in the church in a whole. A lot of the men have taken a back seat within the churches. And they let the women, oh, you go, honey, you go serve, you do this, you do that. And they, they kind of, well, you kind of lead the home, honey, and I'll just kind of let you, you, you're under my covering. And, and we kind of think that we can finagle and, and do this different thing, and we're not maturing in the faith. And you're needed to mature, guys. Women too, but I'm talking right now, guys. We need more teachers in this church. It's right here, right here. Some of you guys have been Christians for 10, 15, 30, 40 years, and you couldn't teach. You, you don't know how to teach. You don't even, some know how to, to share the gospel. And hear my heart now. It's not condemning, but it is to awaken you. It is to exhort you. It is to say, hey, wake up. This is your church. This isn't mine. This is our church. This is the church of Christ. We are members of the body. We need to mature and stop just going recklessly and aimlessly about our lives, but have goals to grow in our Lord Jesus Christ. And this starts, notice, that we are to be those speaking the truth in love. Number one, speaking the truth in love. You know, Truth and love, man, I was thinking about these two things. These are getting increasingly harder and harder to find within our world today. Not just in America, but around the world. Truth and love. So much fake news. I mean, even I was reading some stuff about Israel the other day. We're talking about that. And, oh, you know, this is happening and that's happening and troops are this. And then I found out that it's all lies. It was all clickbait. And even some of that, it's hard to go. What's the truth? What's the truth about morality today? Let's say within our country. It's so, oh, truth is just a relative thing. You see, there is no such thing as absolute truth. And I look at people and I'm, and I'll say, I'm like, absolutely. Hello. You just made an absolute statement about truth. Is your statement true? Obviously it's not because there is no absolute truth. Well, wait a minute. Then that's an oxymoronical thing and you can go into this parrot, you know, let's go round and round. No, there are truths. Well, I don't believe in truth. I don't believe in the truth of gravity. I think it's just a made-up thing. It's old-fashioned. We don't need it anymore. You're just gravophobic. <laughs> I'm going to go jump off the roof and there's no such thing. And what's going to happen? <laughs> What do you think about that now? Oh, I'm grabophobic too now. <laughs> you, see, you see, it's so hard to find truth anymore. And to be honest, we need to understand that there's a lot of people in our universities, a lot of people in our news agencies, a lot of people in our entertainment, that they are purposefully lying to us now. Purposely, It's not even accidental anymore. Some of it's still accidental, sure. But a lot of it's just to, to spread lies, to, to deceive, to, to bring, you know, confusion. I mean, even the whole thing with the Russian collusion thing. You know, they found what they, they did find that Russians, it was interesting, after uh, Trump had won and even before, they were spending money on the Clinton campaign and on the Trump campaign and anti-Clinton campaign and anti-Trump campaign. What are they doing? They're just trying to sow discord. 
That, how brilliant is that? You don't need to throw money at one can or the other. Just get everybody fighting amongst themselves. And what are we doing today? What did they say? There was a poll they just did last week. Would you rather allow somebody, one of your kids, to date someone from the gang MS, was it 13? MS-13, or would you rather have them someone vote for Trump? Now, MS-13, for those of you who don't know, you know, they're out there raping and killing and dismembering and just terrible, terrible game. And the, the, the majority of the people said they'd rather have my kid date someone from MS-13. It's, it's, and again, they're lying, by the way. It's just craziness. But how do you find the truth? And beloved, we're to speak the truth in love. And since truth is relative to so many, again, we need to be mature Christians and not be afraid anymore to speak out the truth. What is the truth? Right here is the truth. We're to speak out the truth of God. To stand unashamedly. Hey, I don't care if it's within the church outside the church i don't care if it's with atheists i don't care with people who make fun of us who who cares we need to be speaking the truth to them in the love of jesus christ hey and by the way this is also to me it says you know notice first of all this is a command speak the truth in love this isn't hey if you're up to it and you feel you know you're up to you're strong that day go ahead and speak the truth in love no it's always speak the truth in love Talia and I, when we got married years ago, we didn't want to play the games that a lot of couples will play. It's like, hey, you know, honey, do I look fat in this? And, you know, she lies and goes, oh, no, honey, you look great. It's like, well, yeah, it kind of makes your belly look a little big on that one. Or, you know, or, hey, honey, am I wearing too much makeup? Or how's this dress look? We didn't go, oh, it looks great. (coughs) (coughs) She's laughing. (laughs) We'll be honest with each other. But we do it with love. You know, it's not like, oh, man, that makes you look like a horse, man. What, what's going on? You look terrible. No, it's, hey, then, you know what? No, it doesn't look very good on you. And, 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 and that's an honest thing, but it's, it was done in love. You see, we need to do the same thing with the world today. So many lies are being taught, even within our schools, about communism, Marxism. Hundreds of millions of people that have been killed in the name of those two false ways of economy and i believe they're just religions but they're not taught that anymore oh this is such a good thing look at norway they're so good look at nor they're just the do you know i just read a study the other day that says within the next few years norway's going to be short at least two hundred thousand workers to support everybody that's on the dole what are they going to do they don't know yet Maybe raise it on everybody else who knows that's what they usually do but we're, we're afraid to speak the truth We're afraid to speak the truth about the history of our nation. There's so many websites you go to and they're twisting and turning words on purpose by guys like Jefferson or Franklin or others, Washington. These guys, most of these guys were godly men. They loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, just go to the the Lincoln Memorial, who they call a deist, Lincoln. Go inside the Lincoln Memorial, and on either side you see partial addresses. I think one's from the Gettysburg, and I forget what the other address was from. Man, this more has more Bible verses than most pre- the pastors today preach from the pulpit. We're being lied to. Don't be afraid to know the truth, study the truth, and speak out the truth, but especially when it comes to our faith, especially when it comes to the lost. Hey, if you're living in sin, if you're lost, if you haven't repented of your sins and and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, hell is a real place. Hell is forever. Jesus said himself said it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth forever and ever. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. You see, beloved in Christ, the mature Christian will tell the truth. The immature Christian won't say a word because they're being tossed to and fro by what everybody else is saying. The mature Christian will speak up in our culture today. They'll speak up on Facebook. They'll speak up on Instagram, Twitter, other things. When they're with their friends to say, hey, you know what? The Bible says this. God says that. 
or what you say about that, that's not true, or, or this or that. And again, we're not going to become the police. That's not what this is saying, but we're not afraid to speak the truth in love. And again, the truth of God's word first and foremost. You know, it's interesting that the mature Christian does not simply do this to be right about something, by the way. Can I have an amen to that? It's not just about winning an argument. It's about loving the truth, but also doing it in love. And sometimes that means we're just going to be quiet. I'm just going to swallow it. And yeah, I, they, I know they think they're just, they're, you know, they're, it's starting to become pa- casting pearls before swine. They're not listening. I'm going to keep praying for you. You see, in Romans 12, 9, it says this. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. You see, that's what true love is. I believe that true love is something that we, we love. You know, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. In 1 John three eighteen, John said this. Little children, let us not love merely in theory or in speech, but in deed, in truth, in practice, and in sincerity. You see, as we're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ in love and we're speaking the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we're, you know, standing up for the truth, we are growing. You know, it's interesting. We're speaking the truth in love here. Love here in the Greek is agape. We speak the truth in the agape love of Jesus Christ. You see, I, I, I firmly believe that speaking the truth is love. You see, when I really love somebody... And I see them out there practicing a sin. Let's say they're a drunkard. Let's say, you know, they're getting drunk all the time. And I've even met people claiming to be Christians. They get drunk every day and they're drunk. And the Bible says very clearly, drunkards, those who practice this sin, drunkenness, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So is it the most loving thing in the world just to say, oh, it's all right, Herm, you just go right ahead and get drunk, bro, because it makes you happy. And I love you just how you are. That's our culture today. I accept you just how, and by the way, you're going to heaven too, because you're a nice guy. And that's what they want us, that's the gospel that's even being preached from some pulpits today, too many pulpits. Instead of, hey, Herm, I love you, man, and dude, I am here for you, I will, I will be with you, but you need to understand that God says if you continue to practice this sin and don't repent, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you are going to hell. Do you understand that? But again, the good news is Jesus died for that sin. And all we need to do is turn away and turn to him. Receive what he did upon the cross. That's love. Hey, if I know that a bridge is out and there's a sign that's up and it fell over that says danger, bridge is out, and I see cars coming at 89 miles an hour and I just let them go on by, well, I just love them. I don't want to bum them out and have them stop and have to take a long way. True love is going to stop, pick up that sign, and even get out on the, the roadway. Stop, man, the bridge is out. You will die. So again, back in our text, instead of wandering aimlessly in our faith, we're to speak truth in love. We are to grow up, notice, in every way. We are to grow up as we speak the truth in love. We are to be growing up in every way in our lives as Christians. Taking our aim, setting the course according to the truth of God's word. You know, there's an old song uh, by a band called Styx. And when I was a young Christian, I still listened to some of their stuff. And there was one called Come Sail Away. You know, I'm sailing away. I've set an open course you know, for the virgin sea. And, and I always change some of the words. It's like I've set an open course according to the word of God or something like that. You see, beloved in Christ, we need to be purposeful about our walks with Jesus. In other words, hey, what is my course today? I need to check our rudders. I need to check everything. I need to check this morning as I wake up, as I come. Man, I'm going to open your word, Lord, because I want to make sure I'm on the right course, that I'm heading in the right direction. 
that I'm growing up in every way as a Christian, to grow in our faith, to grow in our sacrificial lives, to have lives that are sacrificing for our faith in Jesus Christ, to grow in our lives of service within the body of Christ, to grow in our prayer lives, to grow in our giving, to grow in our fasting, in our obedience to God through his word, to grow in our witnessing, to grow in our making of disciples, to grow in our being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we're mainly told within our text, notice, that we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So again, it's not just growing up in ways that like, well, you know what, I'm a Christian, bro, and you can't lay any guilt trip on me because I'm just growing how I want to grow. And I'm becoming me in Christ. I'm just me. No, notice here. We're to be growing into him who is the head into Christ. We, we, is John the Baptist, man, he must increase, I must decrease. For us to grow into Christ means for us to die unto self. To die to our own desires, to die to our own needs, to die into what we watch on television, to what we say to people, to what we do. We need to be doing so as we love Jesus Christ and have hearts that are filled with his love. Lord, you died for me. And to have that just right in front of us all the time. And Lord, I want to grow more and more like you. I want to be like you, Jesus. Maybe you did that when you were a younger Christian. Maybe you've been a Christian for a few years now or many years. And you've lost that wonder, that awe. Oh, hey, I, I just want to be like my dad. I remember being a kid and I'd follow my dad around and, you know, do a lot of the things that he would do. He was a hunter, so I, you know, I'd, you'd make up rubber band guns and we'd pretend we're hunting or different things. And, and you know what? We need to have that same childlike faith in the Lord to grow in him. Lord, I want to be like you, Jesus. I want to be more and more. And I understand that to do that, I need to sacrifice the desires in my life. I need to put those things on the cross. I need to come by the power of your Holy Spirit. You see, as we are members of the body of Christ, and as we grow, we will grow into him who is head of the body into Christ. Romans 8, 29 says this, For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son. Have you been conformed lately? Well, I, that happened when I got saved. I'm all done. No, that's the beginning. Yeah, you got saved, but now the Lord wants to continue to sanctify you, conform you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. You see, as we mature in Christ, according to his word, by the power of his spirit, we're also going to be knowing what's God's will. What does God want from me? What's right? What's wrong? All these things in accordance to God through his word. Philippians 3, 10 and 11, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now, how many here want to be conformed to the death of Jesus Christ? My flesh says, don't raise your hand, Bill. My spirit says, conform me, Lord. Conform me to your death, the death on the cross. He goes on to say, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection. You see, beloved, the one who is growing spiritually will be the one who is growing more and more into the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And less and less like the grumpy old you. you have an amen? amen? Be careful, beloved. Be careful with accepting who you are. None of us should accept who we are because when we came to Christ, we realized we are sinners. And the only one perfect is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I have an amen? amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. And I pray for each one of us, Lord. Maybe we've been carried about, tossed to and fro by some winds of doctrine. Maybe... Man, we've stopped growing up and we just are realizing by your spirit, Lord, that this is something that we need to continue to do no matter how young or old we are physically. 
Father, I pray for each one here. Pray for those who are watching over the internet, Lord. That you would awaken us, Lord. That we would choose the better portion, Lord. That as for me and my house, we would serve the Lord. Lord, may in these days we be enduring until the end. Lord, as Israel has celebrated its 70th birthday, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray uh, for your people there, Lord. And we thank you that we've been grafted in, Lord, by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, lastly, we want to pray for those families uh, in Texas, Lord, who lost children the other day. Lord, we pray for your comfort. We pray for your spirit to move in mighty ways. We pray for the shooter, Lord, that he might repent of his sins and come to know you, believe on you as the Lord and Savior of his life. We pray for those who are still fighting for their lives. May you bless and strengthen and heal and guide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.